We are going to be recording this just so that we can have it on file and you can come back and listen to it at another time or those folks who missed it tonight will be able to, to watch it and listen as well. Well, good evening everybody and Happy New Year. I'm Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And um, yeah, it's 2021. I hope everybody's new year has started off well. Um, and so we have uh, a few things that we want to announce. The first half hour or so is a few announcements, things going on, things happening. And then our speaker of the evening will start right around 8 o'clock. So, so listen in. Uh, I see just about everybody has their microphone muted, so uh, you can have a little microphone symbol either along the bottom of your screen or somewhere in your little picture window. Make sure it's red with a little slash through it, which means it's muted, and then that means we don't hear background noise um, of you know, rustling papers, dogs barking, that type of thing, although I wouldn't mind a few dogs barking. That would be awesome. Um, we have several of our board members here. Uh, Michelle uh, Brocious will be coming up a little bit later on, and she just waved. Uh, Kurt Niski is here as well. I don't know if Kurt has a, a, a video up or he would just want to say hi, Kurt. And then Karu Suboni is also joining us this evening, uh, another one of our board members. All righty. Let's see. Let's, let's go to that uh, slide where we have, oh, and Marianne Romito, that's right. I Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for putting your, your feathers up. All right. Let's go to that bird quiz. Can we see that the, the questions for the bird quiz, please? All righty. So again, this is just a little bit of fun. While we're waiting, there's groups, the names for groups of birds, and I'm going to be going over those answers real, real shortly. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, next. All right, again, I welcomed folks, our, introduced our board members, and we please do take a look at these lovely, lovely photographs that are added to the side of our bullet points. You know, the, a lot of our photos are donation, oh, all of them are donations uh, or permissions from photographers that you know, we're, we look at them and we're like, wow, this is great. I think this one's awesome. There's two ring-billed gulls chasing a Bonaparte gull that happens to have caught a fish. So hopefully the Bonapartes will get a chance to gulp it down before the, the ring-bills get him. All right, let's go to those bird quiz answers. All right, so if you have a group or a flock of cowbirds in your yard, it's called a herd or corral. Yay! Doesn't that make sense? Cows, herd, huh, funny. A flock of hummingbirds, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen a flock of hummingbirds. You know, normally here in Ohio, we get, you know, a hummingbird or two at our feeders. We go out west, and sometimes they are in great numbers. Marianne, have you seen big numbers of hummingbirds at feeders out west? A mute. Yeah, I think broad-tailed hummingbirds are, are, yeah, you'll have to unmute, Marianne. Um, and I, I, like your, I like your glittering because that kind of matches them a lot. Other, other yes, birds it like, is. A hover <laughs> of hummingbirds, and that's what they do, they hover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some other uh, names that are given to these as well, too. This is not the be-all, end-all. A uh, group mm -hmm. of owls is called a parliament. I've also heard it called a hoot, a hoot of owls. Uh, now this one, a group of hawks on migration. If you're ever out uh, in the fall especially and you have a huge number of hawks circling around like a boiling kettle, that is a term that is used by birders. Uh, so a kettle of hawks. I love this next one, number five, a group of roadrunners. As I was mentioning to a few folks earlier, you're probably not going to run into, no pun intended, uh, run into any road runners in Ohio, but look at a marathon or race. Uh, uh, that's just so bad. <laughs> and then a flock of finches. 
And, then, and yes, they do tend to come in flocks as a charm. I like that one. But then I also read, if you have a flock of house finches, then you have a development. Yeah, that, that's just that's just bad. I just thought these were just kind of fun. Kick off the new year in kind of a fun uh, way. So thanks, thanks to everybody who joined in and, and took a look and maybe even tried a few of the answers. All right, next please. All right. So uh, Michelle, Michelle Brocious, one of our uh, board members, will talk about some of our field trips and some of the things that we do virtually or in person. Thank you. Take it away, Michelle. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the second Saturday Bird Walk report, uh, our virtual field trips, and some social distancing birding guidelines. Next slide, please. All right, so in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, Bill Dininer and Dave Grasskemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday Bird Walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. The December 2020 second Saturday bird walk was what we would expect. The count was average for December with 24 species reported. The temperature was 40 degrees and there were a few sprinkles of rain. The three hour and 15 minute walk found few surprises. They had a flock of 25 mallards fly overhead. Two red tailed hawks were kiting close overhead and one Cooper's hawk sat close and in the open for several minutes. All right, next slide, please. All right, last month, our virtual field trip was at Sandy Ridge Reservation to see the American tree sparrow, as well as winter waterfowl, like the trumpeter swan and American black duck. At least seven participants visited the park throughout the month. I'm currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday, January 8th. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, January 13th at 7 p.m. If you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, next slide, please. All right, January's virtual field trip takes place at the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation where we will be looking for the bald eagle. To find the eagle's nest, you will want to head north on the towpath. Follow the towpath until the canal ends and keep walking. And then on your left, you will see a trail marker with a yellow streak on it and an icon of a hiker. Uh, that is the Six Mile Flats Trail. Uh, take the trail into the woods and to the river, and the nest will be in a tree on the other side of the river. I'm told eagles will perch in that tree. Uh, I didn't happen to see any there when I made a trip in December, but I did see a few eagles flying around while on the towpath. Oh, and the Six Mile Flats Trail was really muddy when I went, so wear appropriate footwear. All right, anyways, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species. Journal your thoughts or create a poem or a haiku. Uh, send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the January 2021 virtual field trip tile on the home page. Next slide, please. All right, lastly, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less, staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, wearing a face mask, and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer. All right, thank you everyone for your attention. Back to you, Nancy. Thanks so much, Michelle. Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation is really one of my favorite areas. Uh, again, the towpath is easy walking. Um, it's it's kind of industrial, but it's it's just awesome. You know, you got power lines, you got the 
you know, lots of uh, industry nearby in the flats, but it's just, it's just a really, really neat place. Now, Gloria Ferris, another one of our board members, uh, couldn't be here this evening, so I will make uh, the announcements that she was planning on making. I hope I don't flub up. So uh, if we could get the next slide, please. <laughs> All righty. Uh, there's several things that Gloria works on. Uh, junior, we're working on getting junior memberships, a, a, a little reduced price membership for younger people. Uh, Guardians of Nature, which is a group that uh, will help pull together some ideas um, to help volunteer. Uh, we have a Bird of the Month fundraiser as well as a photography contest. And the Bird of the Month fundraiser as well as the photography contest bird yeah, are the same species of bird. You'll see that in a soon. Uh, we have youth story and activity hour on Saturdays, and then our author speaker program. So let's go to those that junior membership information, Betsy. Again, um, for our annual membership for the junior members, twenty dollars, uh, and we've got two age ranges, seven to thirteen, and fourteen to eighteen. Uh, there will be Saturday sessions, or there are Saturday sessions. It could be uh, a, a speaker, somebody to talk with the, the students. It could be a librarian it, uh, or book discussion. Um, maybe you talk about a virtual field trip that the students will go on. There's just lots and lots of things that we're, we're dreaming up to work with the young people. Next, Betsy. As I mentioned, Guardians of Nature is a uh, group that meets uh, generally two Thursdays, and you can see January 21st and January 28th at 7, again on free conference call. Um, again, we're trying to get again people connected with uh, nature, with birds, and, and take some action. So this is basically a group of volunteers. We brainstorm, uh, we come up with some ideas, and maybe even have some other folks join in. Hey, I know somebody that can do this, and maybe they'll be part of the uh, uh, again guardians of nature. Maybe they want to take uh, another uh, part, a role with the uh, junior membership. So there's lots and lots of things that we're, we're always working on and trying to get volunteers to assist with. Next. Oh, look at that, we had a contest winner for December. Yes, the bird in December was the cardinal. That was our, our uh, a photo, our, our bird of the month. And look at this beautiful, beautiful photo. Uh, I love the title, Good Hair Day. And I think this is a beautiful photo because not very many people take photographs of female cardinals. Yeah, everybody, oh, it's a bright, flashy male, which is fine, it's not a problem. But I think the subtle colors, look at the coloration on the, on the plumage. Look at that beak, look at those, just, it's so pretty. And then her, her hair is immaculate. <laughs> well, she doesn't have hair. But uh, the judges look at uh, the, the focus, uh, the attitude of the, of the, uh, the species, uh, composition, uh, crispness. There's just a, a lot of things that they're looking at. And so uh, congratulations to Elizabeth for that photo contest winner. How about a nice virtual round of applause? It's beautiful. All right, next slide, please. So January, as I mentioned, we have the photo contest as well as the bird of the month. And the photo contest, of course, is the black cap chickadee. This is another favorite of lots and lots of people. So. I would imagine that we'll get a lot of entries for this. Um, so anywhere between January 1 and, and uh, January 28th is when the contest is open. Um, the, announce, the winner will be announced in February. Uh, you can uh, enter photos at $5 per photo. You could or, uh, enter as many photos as you would like. Again, $5 per, fo per photo. And then, of course, any of the, the monies uh, help in conservation education. Next slide, please. 
And of course, our bird of the month, as I mentioned, along with the uh, uh, the bird uh, photography bird of the month, is uh, is the chickadee. And uh, again, people like chickadees, and so any any amount of donation, ten dollars, five dollars, forty dollars, whatever. Again, anything that will help raise some funds for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And you, you check our homepage again. Very, very clearly marked uh, buttons that you can click on for any of these things that we're sharing with you tonight. All right, next slide, please. As I mentioned, we do have a book uh, author series, and uh, in January, uh, these are the, oh, by the way, they, they meet on Sunday, January 17th and 24th at 7 o'clock, and in January it's Carrie Green, and she's authored Studies of Familiar Birds. This is, looks like a beautiful book. I was really unfamiliar with this. I had to look up some information after I saw this, this uh, slide, and I'm like, oh, this looks really interesting. Uh, so um, again, try to join us if you like books and you get a chance to actually speak with the author ask questions of the author, uh, and you know, just have a really one-on-one -on -one nice intimate discussion about, about the books. So we hope that you can join us. Again, check out the home page and the button for the, the author series. Next, please. Oh, guess what? It's me again. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and see what more, what more I have to talk about. Oh, ice cream. Oh, you know what? I am so glad this Winter Robin by Michelle, one of our board members. There she is. She's over there. She took this photo. I just think robins in the winter time are gorgeous. Look at look at the look at those feathers. Look at look at that bird. That's a prize winner. Anyhow, um, we do have Mitchell's ice cream gift cards for sale uh, at our website. Uh, we've got a big old button that says Mitchell's Ice Cream, and uh, we hope that you'll be able to purchase those. Um, we have a, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Christmas bird count, which just happened at the end of December, and then uh, also membership. So there's what the button will look like on our homepage. Uh, again, this is a fundraiser for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. The gift cards are $10 denominations. And uh, once you purchase those, uh, I can either deliver them uh, by hand if you're fairly close, or you, they're in the mail. Um, you know, we had a, a number of them sold for the holiday season, but the holidays are are not the only time. We got birthdays coming up. You might have an anniversary. You might have a, a maybe a softball team or something like that. Maybe somebody that's going to be winning something. Hey, wouldn't this be a nice little thing to give for for a winner for uh, maybe a photo contest winner? I don't know. So anyhow, uh, again, check out our home page and, and click on that uh, Mitchell's tab and uh, purchase the gift cards. Next, please. As I mentioned, yep, we're going to talk about the Christmas bird count which uh, this year in December, which took place on December 27th, which is a Sunday, um, we had 86 participants uh, take, take, go out in our Christmas count circle, which is called the Lakewood Circle, uh, because it takes in a lot of Lakewood, the, the lakefront, but it also goes all the way down to the Strongsville border, the um, Kind of the far eastern side of of the west side of eastern side of the west side of Cleveland, Brooklyn. It goes all the way even scooches over into Lorraine County. So we had people scouring our circle for that day, that uh, uh, December 27th, and we came up with, and this is a record, 89 species of birds. 89 species of birds were seen that day only. So that was that that is the highest that I, in, in my time as the compiler for the Christmas bird count. That is the highest in 45 years. So what, what was it? The weather was good? I don't know. 
were the people great? I think that's the, the big thing, that everybody was out really, really working hard finding these birds. Uh, but I'm not going to talk too much more about our Christmas bird count because, as you notice on this screen, um, this is the schedule that we had for our Christmas bird count um, information. We had a, a couple of pre-Christmas count events, the kickoff in early December. We had a bird ID about mid-December. The count itself, like I say, Sunday, December 27th, but sign up for that Monday, January 11th at 7 o'clock. So about a week from, well, yesterday, um, we are going to go through the list. We're going to see gorgeous photos that people took. And um, not just the birds, but just a, a lot of fun things. So we hope that you can join us. You didn't have to be on the count, but maybe this will get you psyched up for the count for, uh, I was going to say next year, but guess what? this year uh, for 2021, which will be again at the end of December. Um, I think it's going to be a Sunday, December 26th. Yes. So join us for, for that wrap up on Monday the 11th. Alrighty. And next slide, please. Are you ready for the next slide? All right. So next month's program will be uh, studying prairie chickens through using robots and drones. Uh, Dr. Jackie Augustine, uh, she was former associate professor at the Ohio State University at Lima. She has now moved to Kansas, closer to her beloved prairie chickens. She actually has now become, she is a part of the Audubon Society of Kansas. She's going to be running that. <clears throat> And so, uh, so we will be thrilled to hear much, much more about her studies of the prairie chickens, as well as using the, uh, the, the technology that's out there, robots and drones. How about that? So we hope that you can join us next month, Tuesday, February 2nd, right here at 7.30. Thanks, Betsy. And tonight, of our next slide. There you go. Aha! John Hannon of BirdLife International. He's our U.S. representative. And he's going to really pull together linking the habitats between birds of two worlds. You know, we think about our songbirds that we have in the spring and summer as our birds. Well, guess what? They're here for a short while, but guess where they spend a lot of time? Central and South America. So I think we're going to have a great time this evening, and I, I'm going to let John talk a little bit about himself and uh, and how he got involved, and then get into the the program itself. So let's give a nice virtual welcome to John Hannon, uh, the U.S. representative from BirdLife International. John, thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you. And can everyone hear me? A little bit louder would be great. How about this? It's okay All by right. me. If, if that's okay. Now, uh, you've got, you've sent me a sharing screen uh, invitation, but it's not showing up that I can actually start sharing. Um, let me see. Okay, there we go. So, can everyone see me? It's... If, uh, I can Nancy, I can see can some you, of your slides. I can see some of your slides. I also see the rest of your computer screen. I don't know if you can get on okay. to just your your presentation. Yeah, why don't I open the presentation? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why I'm on there. Get me off of there. <laughs> well, good evening, and thank you for. Uh, providing me with this time to talk a little bit about bird life and, uh, and about our global partnership for bird conservation. 
Uh, I wish I could be in person with you all. Uh, I actually was in uh, the, your your fine city uh, about a, a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, my son was looking at uh, at universities, but I I said to to Nancy and to Betsy, uh, as soon as COVID uh, travel restrictions are over, let's go birding. So I'll be back. Um, so just so for those who didn't read my bio, which I'm uh, embarrassed to say I think you posted the entire my entire life story. Uh, but I've been a Audubon chapter member for God knows how long now, uh, 30 some years. Um, I've sort of been in every single piece of the bird conservation life. Uh, Audubon volunteer, chapter president, uh, here in New York, we have a council of chapters, uh, and I was a chap the, the council president. I went on to work for uh, National Audubon Society through the Connecticut State Field Office and then uh, in the international program. I've also done consulting work for the American Bird Conservancy, for Birds Caribbean and Manomet, and uh, now I work uh, full-time for bird life. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with bird life, uh, bird life is the largest global partnership for bird conservation. Uh, partners include National Audubon Society, American Bird Conservancy, Birds Canada, Nature Canada, and many of the partners who I'm going to touch on this evening as we go through the life cycle of the birds of the Americas. Uh, so the way I thought to do this, um, since I can't really see comments uh, or the likes while I'm doing the presentation is I'll go through the presentation and as you have questions, put them in the chat. Then uh, if they're very, very pertinent, perhaps uh, Betsy or Nancy, uh, one of the, the moderators can, can alert me. Uh, and I'm happy to stop and answer a question, or we can take the questions at the end. Uh, hi, this is Betsy. Excuse me, I have a question. John, I think you can X out um, that little video window that's on your desktop. Oh, okay. You should be able to exit out. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I thought only I was seeing that. <laughs> Conferencecall.com. We're not in Zoom. So, so now, now, Sorry, now I understand how difficult. Uh, problem. I, now I understand how difficult it is for people who are on television uh, doing these interviews through through uh, the conference and Zoom and the like. They, you always wonder why they're they're looking in the wrong direction. It's because you can't see anything. You can only see your presentation. <laughs> so let me let me get started. So something that I am sure most of folks uh, on this uh, chat and presentation know, uh, that birds really link our worlds. Uh, at least half of our North American breeding birds, as uh, Nancy mentioned, spend more than 50% of their lives in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, that's about 4.7 billion birds who are going back and forth uh, and migration, although we always think of it in the spring and the fall, is happening constantly. Uh, as one bird is leaving, another is, is uh, arriving. We have migrations that happen internally within country. We have migrations that go from uh, birds of South America to Central America. So they are constantly moving, and they are feeding the ecosystems that, uh, that they live in, whether it's pollinators, uh, whether it's falling prey or, or, or the hunters, they're the raptors. But they are all a crucial piece of the ecosystems that we all depend upon uh, and making sure that we have water, food, and we also receive economic benefit from them. So we do share responsibility for the conservation of these birds and their habitats. So I'm going to start with a couple sad slides so that we can just go uh, right from there to the happy slides. Uh, 
the sad slides are things that a lot of the folks I'm uh, speaking to probably are aware of. Migratory birds are in trouble. Uh, nearly a third of them have population declines, very restricted ranges that are further disturbed by habitat loss, by develop, human development, climate change, et cetera, uh, and have real population level threats. And as I said, the loss of habitat, inadequate habitat management, uh, and now climate change are probably the worst uh, problems affecting them. And many of you probably saw the study that Audubon and many of our other partner organizations worked on uh, last year, which came out with a very science-driven uh, look at the decrease in bird populations and had calculated that since 1970, more than 2.9 billion birds had been lost. Uh, our eastern forests were were birds were victims, Arctic tundra, western forests, but the worst being grassland birds. And that's partly due to the human development for both uh, housing and for agricultural expansion. So the question is, how do we avert this crisis from getting worse? Uh, and I'm sure you probably all agree uh, because Audubon, BirdLife, American Bird Conservancy, and in fact, all of the BirdLife partners, we all agree that science has to underpin all of the work, how we set priorities, how we plan our actions, and how we shape government uh, and advocacy uh, policy work. Uh, we, we feel absolutely 100% uh, that the commitment to rigorous data gathering and analysis is the only way to really properly show how we can do the work and to ensure that the resources that we have are targeted effectively. Uh, and just as you were talking about Christmas bird counts, we have summer bird counts uh, in the Caribbean. There'll be a water bird census done uh, in a couple short weeks. Uh, and in all of these ways, we're able to identify the most threatened species, the most important conservation sites, and the most urgent threats. And then we can find the most effective ways to deal with them. And it's this way that the BirdLife Partnership, and the partnership, as I said, includes National Audubon, includes American Bird Conservancy, uh, 18 other partners across the Americas, and 118 all told across the globe. With this strategic focus, we feel that we can ensure that we can save species, we can conserve sites and habitat, we can promote ecological sustainability, and we can empower people like yourselves, local conservation groups, to do more and to continue to improve the habitat and, uh, and the ecology and the environmental health of their communities. Oops. So what's one of the key factors that we, we depend upon? Uh, it's important bird areas, and I'm sure you all have either been to important bird areas, you may actually, as a chapter, have adopted one or more. Uh, across the globe, there are 13,000 of them. Uh, they cover 26 million square kilometers. Uh, and BirdLife International is the scientific repository of all the data on important bird areas. So if you're doing bird monitoring at your local IBA, uh, if you're doing conservation work, that data, that work is being filtered into a global database that is tracking which important bird areas are protected, which need protection, which have formal protections, which, uh, which, are, which ones are in dire, take in Canada right now, the McKinsey River, uh, where a massive hydroelectric uh, project is being planned. We're fighting hard there because that spot is globally significant for Western sandpipers. And if the hydration of that river and those mud flats has changed, we could potentially lose uh, the Western uh, sandpiper population. Um, 
as you can see, there are both marine uh, IBAs where we've found collections of everything from albatrosses to petrels, um, and then of course there's land-based ones. So I just want to take a few minutes to go through some of the places and the people and the species that make up part of, of the work in the Americas. Uh, I don't know whether piping plovers come through uh, the, the Cayuga uh, or whether they fly past you, uh, but piping plovers are quite a focus of our work out here uh, along the eastern shore uh, line. And they are a species that is endangered. Uh, they're easy species to get everybody to love because they're, as you can see, highly cute. Uh, and actually, National Audubon, along with uh, the Bahamas National Trust, a few years ago, discovered that the probably about 50% of the wintering population of piping plovers can be found in the mudflats of one of the islands in the Bahamas. Uh, Eric Carey, who is the person in the left-hand corner of your screen, is the executive director of the Bahamas National Trust an amazing, amazing person, strong, strong fighter for the environment. And he and his team have been leading a charge and they've actually gotten the Bahamas government to make a national park of many of the spots, the mudflats where the, the piping plovers uh, are wintering. And we really feel this could be the toehold for keeping that species alive so that it can take uh, all of the pressures and the pressures are getting greater as we see storms, uh, the hurricane seasons with climate change getting worse. But once they get to the Bahamas, they have a safe place where they can rest. A little bit further south and west in the Dominican Republic, Yvonne Arias is the executive director of Grupo Jaragua. And uh, for those who have not had the pleasure of going to the Dominican Republic, it's an absolutely beautiful island. Uh, the island is Hispaniola. Half of it is Haiti, half is Dominican Republic. Uh, there you will find two species of real strategic importance, uh, black cap petrel uh, and the big male thrush. Big male thrush is our thrush that is a high altitude thrush. It only will nest above 3,600 feet. And so there are only spots in Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and, and up in Canada where you will find them. Uh, and we are working in a coordinated fashion with Grupo Jaragua and other uh, in the Dominican Republic to ensure that the Bicknell thrush has enough land for its wintering and then with our good friends and colleagues in Vermont and the other northern states to ensure their nesting grounds are kept and preserved. Uh, and in the same way with black cap petrel, we are working both sides in Haiti with rural farmers uh, and people who really when have literally absolutely nothing. Uh, and yet they have made a commitment to protect this black cap petrel, a bird that comes inland nests in the highlands, and then goes back out to sea, and you won't see it for years until it comes back to nest again. And it, meanwhile, if you go back to the mainland and Central America, you'll find in Panama, uh, Panama Bays, a globally significant uh, important bird area for shorebirds, western sandpipers, willets, uh, Wilson's plovers all a whole schematic of both east and west coast uh, shorebirds. Rosabel Miro, who's putting a, a funny face to that parrot, is their executive director. Uh, Panama Audubon is doing a great deal of work with National Audubon. National Audubon has done a great job of, of supporting the work in the Panama Bay. Uh, and. Panama Audubon is a very, very strong bird life partner that is really keeping uh, a key area uh, of wintering shorebirds and also passage away for migrating birds.
If we go down further to Colombia, uh, once again, we have partnered with National Audubon in Colombia, uh, and National Audubon is doing a fabulous job of providing support in the highlands of Colombia for indigenous communities to learn the craft of being bird guides uh, and for setting up small uh, inns and lodges so that the communities really see a benefit to protecting and preserving the birds and their habitats. Columbia has the highest level of bird diversity in the Americas uh, and is just an amazing place. Uh, one of my favorite birds, uh, the cock of the rock right there, uh, is just one of the incredible species that, you, that are native to Columbia. Uh, but this is a really important program, especially for a place like Columbia, where there was years and years of civil war. The indigenous communities were left on their own, had really no resources. Um, the war ended, and they're scrambling to find some kind of economic sustainability in their, in their mountain and highly rural communities. And if we, once COVID is, uh, is, is hopefully in the rearview mirror, having t ecotourism and bird tourism to support their communities as they build sustainable farming and other sustainable uh, economic uh, opportunities is key to supporting those communities and building a strong ethos of bird conservation. On the other side of, of Latin America, South America is Save Brazil. Uh, and Brazil, another incredible country for, for birds and biodiversity. Uh, you're seeing the executive director, Pedro Zevili, uh, receiving a key from Toyota. For Toyota donated a, a truck. You can see it just in the corner there, uh, the bird life insignia on it. Uh, they use those trucks to do all of their shorebird monitoring. Uh, the, well, most people kind of think about the Brazil for the Amazon. Um, there are really two other key, incredibly important parts to, from a conservation standpoint to Brazil. One is the Atlantic forest, which you see on the insert map, the little red circle and the blue circle. Those are the remnants of what was one of the largest forests in the world, uh, home to at least 13 globally threatened bird species uh, and hundreds upon hundreds of other species. And that forest, we are fighting and working to maintain it, even though it is also the area where probably two thirds of the Brazilian human population lives. Uh, so that is Save Brazil's big mission. But from a hemispheric level, their mission also is working, oops, in the northeast of Brazil, right up in this area where the, the mouth of the Amazon is, because that is where the red knots that come down, that's the, usually the first place they, they rest before they go all the way down to Tierra de Fuego. And there are enormous mudflats in that area that are home to hundreds upon thousands of wintering shorebirds, but really key for red knots, wimbrels, and other species that are on our priority list. And so we're working very uh, strongly with Save Brazil to ensure that that area is protected. The other part to Brazil and the other countries that are in the southern part of South America, Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay also, um, are their grasslands. Uh, the grasslands go right to the shore, and so there we find American golden plover, black-bellied plover, and buff-breasted sandpiper. And so there, our partners, Aves Uruguay, Aves Argentina, are working with cattle ranchers and sheep ranchers uh, to find management plans that allow the ranchers to have uh, an income that supports their family. These are, these are family farms uh, 
while still providing the birds with the habitat they need so they can be wintering. And in this picture, you can see uh, they're doing uh, banding and they have decoy uh, buff breasted sandpipers out there as well as our, our live model right there. Uh, this is an incredibly strong program that stretches all the way into the Pampas of Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Brazil. Uh, the Pampas are one of the last great grasslands uh, and the largest grasslands of, of South America. And their cattle ranching has been uh, a tradition, uh, a way of life. And so we're working with currently 500 ranchers across that area to create bird-friendly uh, beef. Beef that uh, the land is certified, that the practices that they use protect everything from bobolinks who are migrating from, from uh, Chicago area and the Great Plains and uh, up in western New York to strange-tailed uh, tyrants and, and local uh, flycatchers. And the cattle ranchers actually really like the program. Uh, they receive a small benefit from the certification. Uh, it's not like coffee where there's a, uh, a big premium, it's a small premium. But what they really like about it is that they've realized that going back to native grasses and the traditional methods of, of r ranching are producing a stockier uh, herd of cattle and they're getting two to three times the meat per, uh, per animal that they were getting before. And so they're literally with less uh, management of the fields because they have smaller pasture, uh, they're re getting a higher return on investment. So we, this is a program that we are working actually in alliance with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with U.S. Forestry Service uh, to grow this because it's a program that we are replicating and Audubon is doing it out in, in the West, as you can see, there's programs in Canada to try to get the beef producers, uh, especially the family farms, to work in a way that is beneficial for grassland birds uh, and also for climate. Because if you do utilize these native grasses, you tend to have a much better uh, carbon retention in the in the ground, and so it's it's it works for everybody, um, and it's a program that ranchers really like. So we're very proud of this program, and we see it as one of our most successful programs for both empowering people, creating sustainability, and conserving birds in the habitat. So what are the common denominators that we're talking about? We work at landscape scale. We work with landscapes that link birds with people, economies, and create a full life cycle conservation plan so that we're not saving them in just one place and losing the birds in another. When we talk about landscape scale, we're looking at a size of 150,000 hectares, which is a little bit more than 300,000 acres to 1 million hectares, which is, you know, 2.4 uh, million hect uh, acres. We pick it, we pick the sites by the priority habitat for priority species. We link up areas that are important for the full life cycle of the bird. And then we find the spots where there are conservation solutions that have been identified and are workable. Our partnerships are always with an enormous array of strong partners, universities, agricultural cooperatives, uh, other NGOs, local leadership in, in government and uh, in, in communities. We always recognize that the human element has to be included. Uh, and then we have plans that build on protected area, restoration sites, working lands, uh, and areas where there's bird concentrations. So bringing us to the chapter 
the Audubon chapter level, I'll just give you a uh, couple uh, case studies of my own chapter, Bedford Audubon. Uh, we got involved in a project that took us into uh, the northeast forests of Nicaragua. Uh, we wanted to track where the nesting uh, wood thrush uh, population that was on our, we have three sanctuaries. Uh, so we teamed up with Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, National Audubon, BirdLife and Forsyth Audubon, which is North Carolina Audubon chapter. Uh, and we put geolocators on the wood thrushes that were nesting on our properties. And we tracked 22 uh, second year male wood thrushes. And we found, we were able to recover uh, four, I think five of the geolocators and three of them had been wintering in the northeast corner of Nicaragua. Uh, and so we, it actually turned out that that part of Nicaragua was one of American Bird Conservancy's birdscapes. So we've been able to continue the work by partnering with American Bird Conservancy and its projects in that area where they're supporting cacao farmers who are doing land management that's bird friendly. Moving out to the, uh, the coast, in my neck of the woods here in the New York, Connecticut uh, area, we have a very strong coastal bird program and it's focused on the Long Island Sound. So I was doing bird surveys on the Sound and in 2011 photographed this uh, American oyster catcher. When I put the band number into uh, the website uh, that um, the, the banding folks uh, use, it turned out that that bird had been banded in Georgia in 2005. It was probably its first migratory uh, trip down past Georgia. And didn't think anything of it until I was working in Nicaragua in 2016. And lo and behold, somebody said, oh, look at this uh, American oyster catcher uh, picture we have. And there it was, F3. And so we learned that this bird was actually crossing somewhere through Honduras and moving from the East Coast over to the West Coast. And it's actually a part of about 80 oyster catchers that we have found uh, bands that are from East Coast birds. So once again, citizen science, chapter people recording, sharing information with colleagues in Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean, we're discovering more and more of the paths of the birds that we're trying to protect, which is going to give us the insight on where we have to really work to make sure we are protecting migratory pathways, stopover sites, and winter resting sites. And so as I mentioned, the, the groups we work with are so varied uh, they range from North American volunteers and luminaries. Some of you may recognize uh, this fellow here, the author Scott Widensall, uh, on a trip with us to, to Nicaragua. These are university students in Honduras. Uh, Bob Rice, who just re retired from a long career at Smithsonian Migratory Bird uh, Institute, a coffee collective in Honduras another one in Costa Rica. We have everybody, private sector, government, rural communities, academic institutions, etc. cetera. Uh, and what are they doing? Well, this is uh, scenes actually from the first international bird festival in northeastern Honduras. And all these students in blue uh, are at the local agronomy school. Uh, this group that's in the lower uh, corner they are learning uh, environmental education. Uh, these students are coffee and, and cattle uh, ranching students. Uh, and these are kids from the local communities. We put together a couple thousand dollars. We bought, and the, the students themselves painted the banners. We bought these uh, Fish and Wildlife Service fact sheets that were in Spanish. The students put together all kinds of educational materials. And for a day, we were in the central plaza of this small town of probably about 10,000 people. 
and they bust in 500 kids from all the rural communities and we had an international bird festival where all the kids were pledging to protect the migratory birds, never to capture them, never to shoot them with slingshots, uh, and to respect all the, the birds and the, and, and the forest uh, that they live around. At the older level, obviously, these are university students. They're doing monitoring now of their own IBAs. Uh, a couple of them, we were able to get Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, professors came down. They did a week-long training. Uh, we equipped them with binoculars, with field guide, and now they're doing regular monitoring of the IBAs in their area. They've established a Christmas bird count. Uh, and they keep on looking for more ways to engage the community that, that they live in and, and themselves in bird conservation. Uh, as you can see, this is working with farmers. These farmers are cacao farmers. Uh, they were practicing completely open sun crops, and now they're all uh, shifting to shade-grown cacao. Uh, and then every country now, has the same kind of news programs that we uh, have here where they're always looking for folks to talk. Uh, this was Honduras's version of the local Channel One uh, news media, and we did a whole hour on, on the value of birds. And as you can see, the ins we also really want to incentivize uh, uh, because when you're a rural farmer and your income is about $300 a year, um, and yet the cost of living, even in places like Nicaragua and Honduras, goes up every single day. Uh, and the cost or the, what, you, what you get for your coffee or your cacao does not go up. You have to have incentives to participate in conservation. So... These, in the upper right-hand corner, these are coffee plants that we're giving to farmers who are committing to shade-grown coffee growing. Uh, they're plants that have a resistance to the virus that coffee plants uh, tend to have in, in shade. And then these are students, as you can see, committing to, to conservation. These young women are all from rural families, and they are now part of a coffee collective that only does organic and shade-grown coffee. Um, and this means that they can actually make a very decent living because they're, they're in the, now the middle part of the supply chain of coffee. They're the testers. They test that the coffee is of, of the, the high-quality grade, that it will allow it to be exported to, to Europe and the U.S. Uh, this means they're going to be able to enter middle-class lifestyles and with the ethos of wanting to have sustainable economies, proper environmental controls, uh, and, and really can build their country in a, in, in a good and, and decent way. So... A lot of people always ask, how do we track pro progress? And so we know migratory and resident birds face lots and lots of threats. So once again, monitoring determines the changes in the populations and it allows us to see whether the recommendations, the conservation, the habitat management plans we're proposing and putting forth are working. And so without man that monitoring data, it's really not possible. So we need people constantly monitoring. You all were just talking about your Christmas bird count. Uh, unfortunately, we can't send you all to Colombia or to Ecuador or any of uh, these places all the time. So we have to have the local populations. And so we are creating what are called local conservation groups. Uh, they're the equivalent of, of Audubon chapters in many of these countries. Um, and while U.S. volunteers are welcome, we really want to embed the skills in these local groups. So we do spend a lot of time, a lot of effort in, in, in bird life. Bird life itself does not have an enormous staff. 
oh, we depend on the partners, the Audubons, the ABCs, the Sa Save Brazils, the, the Panama Audubon Societies. You all produce the volunteers, the, the people who go out. And what we do in, in many of the rural countries and areas that we work in, we teach the data collection, we help design the plots and the timing, and then we pass the baton on. And we've created local conservation groups. And then we help fund so that they can purchase binoculars, so that they can have bird festivals, so that they can have materials to engage their communities uh, and build more and more of a desire within the communities themselves to, to have long-term sustainable habitat and, and bird populations. And unlike the birders in the U.S., like this, this group up here in, in the right-hand corner, a lot of our local conservation groups don't have all the fancy optics and cameras that we're all lucky enough to, to have around our necks. Uh, they go out with sometimes I, I've taken student groups out. We, we had in Honduras a class of 35 students showed up for a training, and we had eight binoculars. And you could not believe the patience of these kids as they, you know, we, we'd have – a hummingbird in a tree, and each person would pass binoculars quickly to the next one so that everybody could see the bird and get on it and get the field marks. Uh, things that, you know, we would up here probably never think of uh, uh, would, a bunch of kids would be able to, to have the patience to do. But the desire is there, and so we keep on trying to outfit people. Uh, many times a group will only have a single bird guidebook, and, you know, they'll take turns studying it. I've been out with kids where one kid will be focused on writing down the Latin name of the bird that we just saw, another one's writing the Spanish or the French name, and then the other one's asking me, well, and what's the English name? So that they know all of the different ways of, of identifying that, that, that bird. Um, it's really amazing the desire that our colleagues across the hemisphere have to engage in a mutual uh, work of conservation. And so how do you help? I know you are all already involved in local seasonal bird counts. Maybe you have adopted an IBA. IBA. If you haven't, that's a great way to think about it. If you've adopted all of the local IBAs, think about uh, an IBA that uh, – somewhere in uh, in a place where the birds that you watch in the spring and summer are wintering uh, and then always assisting with trainings and with the uh, equipment needs. If you are buying a new pair of binoculars, there's someone in Latin America or the Caribbean who could use your old pair. Uh, there's, you know, we, we should never let anything go uh, by the wayside. If once we get past COVID, Getting out back into the field, whether it's locally or in another country, coming down and working with the farmers on habitat plans, helping students improve their skills, being part of a monitoring team. Uh, these are all ways in which local chapters can really see the full life cycle of the birds they appreciate and also get to learn and know and meet the people who are your partners in conservation. And if you just want to kick back a little bit, but you still want to help, come visit as a tourist. Uh, I'm sure several of the people who are on this call have gone places, uh, but there is nothing like going to a place like Colombia, Panama, Ecuador. Uh, if you have the time, getting further down to a place like Bolivia, uh, where you might spend two weeks just going out uh, into these incredible vistas, uh, flooded uh, grasslands where cattle ranchers are there, but so are buff-breasted sandpipers, so are blue-throated macaws, uh, and a whole plethora of absolutely beautiful wildlife. And meanwhile, while we're all still stuck here, then our biggest trips are to the grocery store. Um, 
always be thoughtful about what you purchase because really that more than anything we do every day and if we buy Folgers coffee that was grown in Vietnam in a field that used to be a beautiful habitat but has now just been leveled and had fertilizer poured into it and a bird can't be found 10 uh, kilometers near it, that's not supporting the birds we love. But if we're buying organic, fair trade, whether it's birds and beans, whether it's uh, – I, I now I'm buying coffee at my local stop and shop that has uh, bird-friendly seals. Uh, so it's not even something that you have to find in a specialty store. But there's responsibly sourced chocolate. There's bird-friendly coffee. Uh, it's not available in this country, but there's ibis rice in, 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 in Asia. Look for organics in the fabrics we wear. Uh, there's always the, the potential of making the right decision. And then spread the word because we need everybody working with us. And in that way, we'll see a beautiful world and we'll pass one on to the kids that uh, are, are coming up uh, behind us. So with that, I thank everybody for their attention, and I'm now happy to, to take questions. All right. Well, thank you, John. Let's Again, let's give John a nice virtual round of applause. There you go. Um, I just wanted to let you know, John, that Western Cuyahoga Audubon has adopted the Rocky River Important Bird Area, with, and we've done a we did a five-year breeding bird study uh, on that. In that it, the land belongs to the Cleveland Metro Parks, so we're partnering with with the Metro Parks and how hopefully having them make wise decisions as to um, you know what areas to remain wild, uh, where they want to put a parking lot, you know, that type of stuff. So, that, so we did that. That's and we, fabulous. And we, yeah, and we also helped with, um, uh, and as, as, as a matter of fact, it's going on right now, um, the uh, Doan Brook IBA, which flows into Lake Erie, um, and part of the Shaker Lakes, and then there's a, a monitoring process going on at uh, Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. So fabulous. Yep. And and I did ask uh, another question in the chat, or I made another comment. Um, well, uh, does BirdLife International support bird-friendly coffee coffee plantations? And you answered that question because yes, our Audubon exactly. chapter, our yeah, our Audubon chapter does um, sell um, or directs people to birds and beans to purchase their coffee. That's, that's terrific. I want that. That is so yeah. important. I want that chocolate, and, though. Oh, yes. Well, I'll talk about the chocolate in a second, but I, I, I really, I, we, we don't internalize enough and, uh, most of the time. Uh, probably the folks on this call do. Uh, but just think about, you know, you're a, you're a farmer, and you, your kids, whether you're in Honduras, Nicaragua, they they want cell phones. They've seen everybody else with them, and yet you're bringing home four dollars a day. And shade-grown coffee allows you to triple that income, and you can actually feel like you can feed your kids. You can give them some of the things that they that they're looking for. Uh, and it's really it, it makes such an incredible difference I ask everybody who hasn't yet decided to do that to really not just for the birds but it's for humanity as well it's, it provides the ability to keep the family farm because what's happening to the people who haven't gone shade is they're losing their farms they can't afford to, to continue that lifestyle. So they end up going to, in Honduras, Tegucigalpa. Tegucigalpa is too dangerous a city. So what happens? They start coming north. And then they end up in Tijuana at the, at the wall. Uh, 
and we're creating this this refugee crisis. Uh, well, we're not. Hopefully, every one of us is buying. <laughs> the, but that's that's what's happening. It's not because people want to come over the wall and uh, and get a social security check or any of the nonsense that's uh, spread around. It's desperation. Uh, it's another dust bowl like we had in the 30s in in the Midwest. Uh, and then the chocolate. I'll just say Nicaragua, Peru, Colombia, they are producing some of the finest chocolate that the world knows. And they're doing it all in bird-friendly ways. And so I think um, there's Timothy's uh, bar, there's Champlain chocolate, um, there's Zorzal, Z-O-R-Z-A-L. Zorzal chocolate is a chocolate that is made in the Dominican Republic. And the sole purpose, it's a friend of mine who's actually from Wesleyan, Massachusetts, started it. Uh, he, keep, he keeps get, buying from the farmers at a high price, but only if they'll put half of their land in conservation for Bicknell thrushes. So you know that you're getting a good return on that chocolate investment <laughs> when you buy. <laughs> and then out in San Francisco, there's dandelion chocolate. So there's all sorts of wonderful uh, ways you can thoroughly enjoy yourself and know that you're working towards bird conservation. And wow. then I think uh, I, I see another question uh, about coordinating studies. And yes, we, we coordinate uh, with the Institute for Bird Populations. A lot of our partners in Latin America are part of the MOSI program. Uh, I've participated in MOSI in Honduras uh, and in Nicaragua, but uh, we have other partners uh, throughout uh, the hemisphere that are that are doing that. It's terrific. It's a, absolutely vital work. And to, to answer whether the data enters into our repository, it enters into our repository if it's done on IBAs. Uh, that's how that that's that's the part that we're eventually. Uh, responsible for. Somebody's giving a thumbs up to dandelion chocolate. <laughs> I have, I have. Yeah, I have. I haven't tried that, but that it sounds delicious. All right. Uh, and uh, any other folks that want to chat, or, or you can unmute and ask directly. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss out a question. You know, you, you mentioned North American areas like for the Bicknell's thrush and things uh, like out west and along the coast. Uh, you mentioned Central South America. How about some of those, those uh, migratory pathways where you need to rest and refuel? Um, you know, are those also considered rather than you know, just the North or Central South America? But some of those other areas, I mean, my backyard, I want my backyard to be a, right. a, a rest and refueling station. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and it, I, I used to tease my, my friends at uh, Nature Conservancy who, you know, have that great slogan, uh, you know, what is it, saving the last great places. And I, I said, well, we at Audubon make every place great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but that I think that there's the individual responsibility uh, this time of year uh, I've got six or seven feeders out there that are chock filled so uh, when, when it snows they've got uh, a nice little bit of, of fuel to, uh, to keep them you know keep the calories going um, if you are landscaping your yard preferred uh, friendly, uh, making sure that you've got native plants, that the pollinators will have plenty of bee balm, and uh, in our case, ironweed out here in the New York area. Then you also can talk to your neighbors so that you have a larger swath of, of land, uh, because the minute you do that, I, I have two neighbors who have retired recently, and they've gotten in, involved in bird watching, so I've been telling them, oh, you got to put... Uh, this plant in and now we'll get more warblers coming in we won't just have the uh the robins and the cardinals and so building that ethic for us at at the bird life scale 
uh, we're very interested in rest stops as well as the final uh, wintering uh, grounds, you know, and Tierra de Fuego is famous for the red knots, but the red knots do stop in north uh, eastern Brazil. There's a population that stops in those same mud flats in the Bahamas uh, where the piping clovers, and we have to ensure that those key sites that are the stopover sites are also protected. Uh, so to your to your point, those stopover sites are supremely important. Uh, if you if you're lucky enough to go to Mexico and to Veracruz, which has been dubbed the River of Raptors, it's the choke point in Mexico where it gets such the landmass gets so thin that every raptor that is continuing past there flows through that 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 area, as do hundreds of thousands of wood storks, um, ibises, everything that you could think of. But I've sat there and in one day counted 200,000 swains and hawks fly over me. Uh, literally three, four miles of birds, because that's as far as my eyesight goes. Uh, that area, even though everybody thinks of it as this migrating, at night the birds put down. So that's a key stopover site that we have to work with the ranchers because literally hundreds of thousands of Swainson's hawks or broadwing hawks are going to stop there and literally look for a perch. Uh, and so we're, we're doing forest reforestation there because of this key stopover uh, that most people think of a, a, literally as a migration channel, but the birds do stop there. Um, so you're you're absolutely right. Whether it's your backyard or you know, I don't know whether anybody on the call has ever gone out to uh, the Del Mar Peninsula in in May to see the shorebird migration. Uh, that's an amazing spot that for time immemorial, because on the second full moon uh, of May, the horseshoe crabs come up and lay their eggs. And literally, the shorebirds and the gulls just suddenly appear out of nowhere because they feed on on those sh uh, horseshoe crab eggs, and that's what's going to give them the energy to get to the tundra for their nesting sites. Um, that that's a vital stopover. They're there for all of like three, four days. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, am I am I getting uh, background noise or are you hearing it as well? We all are. Uh, those of us who yeah. So whomever may have not have their self muted, please mute your microphone. Please, please, please. We're getting a lot of background noise. Thank you. Okay. There we go. There we go. Um, so yes. Stopover sites are absolutely key. It also sounds as though um, having ecotourism is a very important thing. I can't wait for COVID to be over because I haven't visited a whole lot of areas, but I, you know, I'm, and I, maybe a number of folks that are already on this uh, presentation, maybe they have had some wonderful times in Central and South America. I, that would be awesome. Yes, and, and I don't know how many uh, are, are aware on this call, but, you know, National Audubon Society has made a, a very large commitment to, to ecotourism uh, and is working with Rock Jumper and, um, and several other really reputable tour groups. And chapters can actually organize trips through uh, these tour groups, and you can, you can actually raise money for the chapter. Uh, I, I was in Ecuador uh, with a it was a, a chapter leaders group and there was a woman from Florida and she's led three trips now to Colombia and raised several thousand dollars for her chapter and everybody on the ch you know it, it, she just sells it basically to the chapter and they sell out and it's a bunch of good friends who go and a little bit of the money goes into the chapter and these communities, 
this is incredible. Uh, you know, uh, they've been getting stats from Colombia and from Belize and from the Bahamas, and the communities that are participating in this ecotourism are seeing a hundred percent growth in their in their economy because people who were subsistence farmers now are bird guides and there's there there's a training that they go to and you know if, so, if you speak english you get paid a little bit more if, you know if you know all the latin and english names the birds so that you're you're certain that you're going to get a, a really good uh trip but can you imagine you know, somebody who's used to getting maybe four dollars a day working in the coffee fields a group like us goes down says wow thank you so much whether we hand them a twenty dollar or thirty dollar tip and there's ten of us they've made three hundred dollars in a day that uh, you know they're just like how can i do more of this <laughs> and and then they're asking how do we protect these birds because obviously these crazy north americans love them <laughs> and so uh it and there's nothing like going to other countries and meeting people who have similar likes to what you have and realizing that we are really one large human family that that, that uh, we, we all care for our children we all love our towns you know the, these are all common threads and, and it just is a wonderful experience I think on that note uh, I want to say thank you so much for the presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat. Let me just take a quick look. Nope, don't see any more. But really, really appreciate your expertise and knowledge. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to um, seeing some of the other partners. And thank you so much. And, and I look forward to coming out and birding with you at your IBA. Oh, we'd love, well, we'd love to have you. Yeah, we've got some awesome areas around here. All right. Well, thank you so much. Everybody thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Have a good, have a good new year. Thank you. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye.